Okay, so um, I'm going to answer a few questions that were from the um, from the chat, and then I will open it up to live questions. Let's see. Somebody asked about other objects of concentration, and um, and there the Buddha actually gave forty objects of concentration. So there are lots of others. In some traditions, you might look at something like a candle flame. In Buddhism, we have, um, uh, some of you may be familiar with what's known as the Brahma Viharas, which are the heart practices of Buddhism. Loving kindness, joy, compassion, and equanimity. Those technically are um, Samatha practices. Um, in some traditions, they use sound. As a, as a concentration practice. So there are many other objects available. The breath is used in, in many traditions across the world in various, you know, not just Buddhism, because it's always there, it's available, and it's, um, we don't have to do anything for it to be there. We know it's always going to be there. So it's a very commonly used object. Somebody asked about how this was different from Vipassana. And um, because Vipassana uses the breath and also builds concentration, which is true. So in Vipassana, because the breath isn't the only object, um, so this is, as I mentioned earlier, Sila Samatha Vipassana. So this person is asking about Vipassana, which is also known as insight, meditation, or a lot of the mindfulness instructions are similar to Vipassana. Um, in Vipassana, when we go beyond the breath, we might notice like right now, it's more stream of consciousness. Like I can see my hand moving and I can hear my voice. And now I'm feeling my um, legs on the chair. And now I'm seeing your faces on the screen. So, you know, that's more of like a stream of consciousness with a lot of different objects. So in Vipassana, the breath is one of millions of potential things that can be coming through our awareness. What's consistent in Vipassana is the present moment, but the contents could be quite varied. So that's really how uh, one of the ways that Vipassana is different. Another um, way that it's different is that really what we're cultivating is quite different in Samatha and Vipassana. In Samatha, because we're coming back to one object of awareness over and over, we're really um, challenging those compulsive thought patterns in a way that deconditions them and that we can also see what they are. And also because there's one object the serenity, there's a lot more serenity possible, not to say there isn't serenity in, um, in Vipassana, there is, but in Samatha, with the one object, there's a lot more stillness that's possible. And also, as the practice goes on, I saw Chris has been asking about the, the jhanas, which I'm not going to get into tonight, but there are um, deep progressions of the practice. If one was say to do a two week retreat or longer retreats that at that point, the two practices start diverging. Um, but Vipassana is a great practice and, um, and it's cultivating the capacity to be with whatever is arising without getting overly attached to the pleasant things, without getting overly, you know, aversive to the negative things where we just can't stand it if something isn't the way we want it, or without getting bored with the neutral things. So in Vipassana, we're really learning to be with whatever is arising in our experience with a lot more equanimity. And that's important too. So both of these, you know, kinds of practice are important for cultivating, you know, peaceful living and the ability to suffer less. They're, they're both really helpful. Let's see. Um, somebody had asked about when we're noticing what's going on in our awareness, 
it's is there a shift from when we're just completely identified with it to when it becomes an object where there's some space from it? And yes, that is one of the great things about, you know, most meditations is that we can move from being completely identified with our experience. Like say we're having thoughts that are, um, you know, we're having ruminating thoughts about something, the ability to go, oh, I'm having a thought about, uh, you know, I'm having a, I'm planning. I'm just compulsively planning. Like I used to have a student who would come on long retreats and she'd find that she would be planning her next retreat. So here she was on a two week retreat. Instead of being on the two week retreat, she was planning her next two week retreat, you know? And she went, gosh, that's really silly. You know, I should actually be on this retreat. So, you know, we do these things, but it's all of them are taking us out of the present moment. So when we can now say, oh, that's planning. I mean, this is more of a Vipassana thing to identify that. Um, it gives us some space. So in, in the Samatha, we're just, we're not so much spending time with the thoughts the way we would in Vipassana. We're just coming back to the breath so that we break the compulsiveness of just going there. You know, we're kind of deconditioning that compulsiveness. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, I'm Chris, I know you're wanting to me to talk about the jhanas, but um, we're, we're not quite at that point, so I'm not going to get into that tonight. Counting breaths. Um, yes, uh, next week I'll give the instruction with the counting. So that is another way to um, find that we can stay with what's happening better. It brings um, some rigor to the practice. So next week I will get into how to use counting as part of this practice, but it can be a way of, um, of just staying with the breath a little bit better. And um, Anyway, I'll, I'll get into that more next week. Let's see. I'm able to meditate first thing in the morning. Yes, I really encourage people to meditate at the time that's best for you, if possible. You know, if, you're, if it's better in the morning, then try and do your sit in the morning. You know, go with what is your strength and don't make it harder unless, you know, sometimes we can't... Um, we just don't have time. And so we have to do it at a time when we're not as, as sharp. But if possible, try and do your practice at the time that's most optimal for you. Let's see, some readings to calm the mind. Um, well, I think a lot of what Rick does is really helpful. I really love the way that he integrates the psychology and the neuroscience and the Buddhism and um, He's, you know, being a psychologist, he's very good at integrating all of that material. Um, why stay with the upper lip rather than the in and out of breath? Well, you can notice, you are noticing the in and out, but you're not following it into the body. So um, we are noticing the in breath and the out breath as it's passing this area. So the, the object of the meditation is always the breath just to be clear. Okay, can you speak more about cleansing ourself? Yeah, so um, in the, this is really gets back to what I was saying earlier about the um, purification of mind and the, and the thinning of the me. And what, one of the things we notice when we meditate is that we have a lot of compulsive thought patterns that we keep going off into thoughts. And if one has an ongoing meditation practice, what you can start to see is that the thoughts um, have patterns. They're not, um, they're, you know, the Particular contents might be different, but the themes are the same. Like some people will find they go into fantasizing a lot. You know, some people will find that they go into planning. Some people will um, fall asleep during meditation. And whatever is um, happening, we're 
basically seeing the way our mind works all the time off the cushion. We're getting to see that close up because we're um, observing it. We're trying to be with a particular thing and direct the mind and we're seeing all the things that get in the way of that. And so this is really what is happening when we're um, with purification of mind, we're seeing those, we're seeing maybe how they, they cause suffering. And through something like meditation, we're loosening that up. So we can always go back to the planning and the fantasizing and the, you know, the ruminating if we want to. But if we don't have a choice, if it's compulsive, that's really where we a lot of life suffering comes in. And the freedom from that is really a big part of what meditation is about. So we're deconditioning. This is the software upgrade from just having, you know, synapses that are huge because that, that pathway has been traveled over millions of times that may cause us to not feel that good. We're replacing that with something that is neutral or positive, which is the ability to just rest with the breath. And that's, you know, in a simple way of describing it, that's what we're doing with a practice like this. Let's see, is there a difference between feeling sedated and becoming serene? Yes, and this is where the concentration and the serenity together, we're not just looking to go into a sedated place. That's not really what the practice is. Um, and this is where the, one of the things that can happen is for the mind to become a lot brighter and a lot clearer to have a lot more clarity of the breath. So this is part of what offsets a sense of being sedated. There's actually a thing that can happen in the practice and, and next week, maybe I'll talk some if I have time about the hindrances and how to work with them. That would be a good thing to talk about. Um, but one of the things that can happen, especially in concentration practices, is that our concentration can get stronger than our energy level. So we're, there's a balance of concentration and energy. And if the concentration is stronger than the energy, something can happen called sinking mind. And in sinking mind, we aren't thinking a lot, but there's a dullness. And you know, I've actually heard like on the radio and other things, people trying to get people into this place of sinking mind, you know, they're sort of encouraging sinking mind. What's good about sinking mind is that you're not thinking a lot. So it is serene, it feels kind of dreamy and like you're sort of in clouds, but there isn't really a clarity there. So it's fine if that happens, it's not, you know, a bad thing necessarily, but then we wanna just bring in a little bit more energy so that we can really, we're not really totally present when thinking mind's happening. There's a dullness to it. Um, let's see, is there an optimum amount of time for a sit? Well, I usually, you know, it's really what works for you. If it's, if the most you can do a day is five minutes, do five minutes. I think that a really healthy daily practice for somebody who's been meditating for a while is 30 minutes. But that might seem like a lot for you. So you don't need to make that a bar that's so high you can't get over it. You know, if you start with five minutes and then if that starts feeling more comfortable, you go to 10 and then you go to 15 or, or maybe on the weekends you sit longer when you have more time. That's another way to experiment with sitting longer when you're not so pressed to, you know, get to work or things. But I really equate meditating with, I mean, for me, there was a big turning point in my 20s when I um, meditation, I know, started noticing that the days I meditated, I just, the days went better. Didn't really even matter so much if it was a, a good meditation or a not good meditation. It was more about the commitment to do it and we now know from all of the neuroscience research of what there's, there's two, between two and 500 studies a year now on meditation, um, that it's good for you. So I suggest 
moving it from the category of like cleaning out your garage where you'll do it sort of when you get around to it and have some extra time to brushing your teeth that, you know, we don't go in front of the mirror every morning as we're brushing our teeth and go, wow, I'm having a really good tooth brushing today. You know, maybe I'll do this again tomorrow because it was really good today. You know, or if, if it's not so good, we go, well, no, I'm just going to skip that tomorrow. That wasn't very fun. You know, we do it every day because it's good for us. And meditation is the same. In my view, it's the same thing where we, there's so much evidence now to show that it's good for us that um, to really make that commitment, I mean, it may be a lot to do it every day, but to find an amount that's right for you and to um, stay with it is really my suggestion. Let's see, I wonder if there's anybody who has their hand up. No, we've got all chat, so I will keep looking at the chat here. Um, Okay, what do I do? Somebody was asking, what do I do if, um, what do I do with, with hindrances? I'll, I'll talk more, oh, obsessive thoughts. How do you work with obsessive thoughts even when you keep going back to the breath? Well, this is pretty much the human condition. You know, this is, we're getting right into the first noble truth of Buddhism, which is as long as we're identified with the ego self and our, with our thoughts as being something compulsive that we are so identified with that there's no space or freedom from it, we're going to suffer. That's really what the first noble truth of Buddhism is saying. So meditation is basically exercise for your consciousness. That's what it is. And if you think about the Samatha practice as, as strength training and Vipassana, like cardio, you know, um, they're all doing something for our consciousness. So when you have obsessive thoughts, part of what we're doing in the Samatha practice is we're coming back to the breath. It's just like lifting weights where you're doing your 15 reps. You know, you're doing repetitions for X amount of time. And every time you find you have an obsessive thought and you come back, you're challenging. I mean, now they know in the neuroscience, you're actually challenging the strength of that neural pathway. So those obsessive thoughts, usually they're not helping. You know, they're, they're at best neutral and at worst causing some kind of suffering. So really the way to, um, gain some freedom from that is to challenge them by coming back to the breath. And, you know, I have students I've worked with now for 15 years who've been with me since the beginning when I started teaching and they, their lives are better. You know, it's something that just like with physical exercise, if we stay with it over the course of time, you may not see it day to day, but over the course of like months and years, you can see that your life is better, that you're suffering less, that you're doing less harm. And I love it when people come and they say, well, it was, you know, my spouse or, or my kids noticed that I used to get triggered by this and I don't get triggered anymore or I get less triggered than I used to. That's what I mean. If when we're getting triggered, that means we're so identified with that belief that, um, that it could, you know, ruin our whole day. I mean, the, the worst case of this kind of getting triggered is when we see somebody in a road rage incident. Somebody cuts them off in traffic. I mean, they may not even have seen the person, but, you know, we'll forget what the reason is. You get cut off in traffic and it ends up in one person killing the other. I mean, you know, we've all seen this in the news. Talk about being compulsively identified with your thoughts. You know, nobody who's in prison for killing someone else in a road rage incident, if you go to ask them, was it worth it? None of them are going to say yes. But they were so compulsively identified with their thoughts that when that happened, they couldn't break away and stop doing it. So this is, I mean, nobody here would do that, of course, but 
this is really what it's the same principle is that we're challenging um, the way in which each of us and we all have this. I mean, um, it's part of the human condition until we start doing something about it. Uh, we have these places where we can get triggered and we're deconditioning that, we're de-escalating that, es that and we're deconditioning that neural pathway that led to somebody killing someone else in a road rage incident or, you know, our version of that where we suffer and so that we can suffer less than, um, than we are, than we suffer when those neural pathways are so deep that we can't get out of them. And that's what we're seeing in meditation. We're seeing the ones that are so deep that they, we can't get out of them. So this is really what we're doing with the repetitions of, um, of challenging those patterns, basically, so that we have more freedom, we have more of a choice that they are so deeply ingrained that we basically have no choice except to, to get identified with those thoughts. Okay, so our time is up and we will be having the breakout groups in a minute, but um, thank you for being with me. And I look forward to um, being with you next week to get into working with hindrances and more about um, what is concentration? What, what does it look like and how can it deepen? And thank you all for being here. It's really been lovely to be with you. Thank you, Tom.